professor of English, has been with us at Ball State since 1937. He's a man who graduated from Ohio Wesleyan in 1917 and has his master's degree from the University of Chicago and a doctor's degree from George Peabody. He served, as you know, many, many years, and some of his specialties have been uh, such things as the uh, oh, little cars, I understand. I never was in one of his classes, but they tell me about these cars. Uh, then he also is specialized in Shakespeare, and he's been both to the Shakespearean territory in England and the Shakespearean territory in northern Italy. And then in addition to that, uh, we commissioned him to write a history of Ball State Teachers College. And he's going to visit with us this evening about four steps on the way. Where is Charlie? <laughs> this group is yours. This is Di, Mr. Bracken, President Emmons, Dr. Linton. Card pack holders. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you who came before the 4x6 era of BC cards. <laughs> I greet you tonight. Not with a hail and farewell after a quarter of a century in Ball State. For me, aye, there will be no rub to this termination of activity at Ball State. For as long as I can consider our alumni, the better than the Dow Jones educational average, <laughs> and learn about your activities from Washington to California, Michigan to Florida, I'll be with you in spirit tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. My topic for tonight is Four Steps on the Way. And this subject was chosen to bring to your attention the early and rather unfamiliar activities on this campus that preceded the later growth and the attainment of excellence of the Ball State that most of you have known and experienced. The high quality of leadership of the present administration that has put this college in the very top ranks of educational institutions is known and appreciated by us all. Dr. Emmons, we salute you. You who predate the Emmons era need no briefing on the early progress of the college at the state institution under the outstanding leadership of dynamic President Burris, our beloved President Pittenger, and the interim, the competent leadership of W. Wagner. In my research, I received aid and information from near and far away places some giving accurate remembrances, others sometimes conflicting data, but not too much which had to be finally ferreted out after a tedious but rewarding experience. The years of Ball State as a going state institution will not be dwelt upon tonight. Rather, I intend to point up a significant thing, and this is the heart of the message, that there is no, and never has been, a loyal, interested, and active community college relationship. It is to those pioneers of this relationship, their interests, efforts, and sometimes heartbreaking failures that I addressed my thesis, Four Steps on the Way, or Ball State's predecessors. There is not, nothing ever happens unless it's first a dream. Dr. Emmons has been talking about his dreams. There were three men in this community who dreamed of this institution. Way back in 1893, 69 years ago. And their names were Frank Heimbaugh, editor of the Muncie Herald. George Higman, founder of the Mutual Home and Savings Association. And George McCullough, real estate and traction magnate. There were others in the group, but those three men dreamed the dream. On the first institution on this campus, there were 15 trustees. And before I get into that, I should name the four steps on the way, the four institutions that preceded Ball State. Eastern Indiana Normal University, Palmer, University, Indiana Normal School and College of Applied Science, and finally, the Muncie Normal National Institute. I'll explain that bifurcated title a little later. The first Board of Trustees 
were 15 in numbers. The trustees from each of the 12 townships, the superintendent of schools of Muncie, the superintendent of schools of the county, and one citizen at large. In May 1896, Eastern Indiana Normal University was given its Articles of Incorporation by the Secretary of State. A month later, in June that same year, the prospectus was set forth. It's a very interesting document. 326 city lots were cut out of a piece of real estate that used to be farmland, and the section of the town thereby created around it was called Normal City. A 10-acre tract in the middle of that was saved for the institution. The lots ranged in price, now get this, from $150 to $600. That was the most expensive lot, the corner lot. From the sale of these 326 lots, the hope was that $90,000 would be realized. 35,000 of that would be put into a university building. 10,000 more for equipping the building. 22,000 was to go to the people who owned the land from whom it was bought, and 1,000 for the streets and sidewalks. <laughs> Any balance left over was to go to the association, <laughs> the Eastern Indiana Normal University Association. The sale realized enough after it was consummated to build the administration building. It was built by a contractor in Red Keys by the name of Marion Hathaway. It was planned by an architect in Lafayette. We seem to love architects in Lafayette. The building as completed and dedicated August 30th, 1899, cost $32,949. Since that time, the college has spent $525,000 on the same building. <laughs> I said something about the town and gown relationship. Because when these three men dreamed up this institution, the commercial club, which was the predecessor of the Chamber of Commerce, immediately got behind it and announced on July 1896, just two months after the incorporation, its entire approval of the project. By August 1st, just two months after the sale started, half of the lots were sold. Then came the presidential election of McKinley and Bryan, and the sale stopped. Nothing happened. So they got together and reorganized the due date, which was supposed to be September 1st, and made it May 1st, 1898. On the last day, April 30th, 1898, there was still $7,000 short, that is, 35 lots had to be sold in order for the thing to be realized at all. These are the things that we don't always understand. This man, George McCullough, went to the banks and borrowed $7,000 on his own mind in order to make the thing successful. So May 1st, 1898, the thing went over the top. The result was that after that, they felt sure they could go ahead and uh, build a building and get a president to organize the institution. A man by the name of Kumler, K-U-M-L-E-R, with the fascinating title and uh, initials of F-A-Z, Kumler, <laughs> had been president of a college out in Missouri, a United Brethren College by the name of Avalon, beautiful name, a successful president of a college of the United Brethren Church. He was born over here just north of Hamilton, Ohio. His father was a very successful farmer, so much so that the man himself, this was Dr. Coomer, had $20,000 to invest in this college building out in Missouri. I know that because I have seen the Board of Minutes of the Directors 
so kindly loaned me by Dr. Coomer's daughter, Mrs. Jan Tedman of Dayton. Because in there, they acknowledge the fact that they owed President Coomer $20,000. So I presume he invested it in the building. So when he came here, that money was in his pocket. I haven't been able ever to just, uh, I haven't been able to find whether he put some of the money of his own in this building or not. But Mrs. Tedman thinks he did. Anyway, after he'd been here two years, or nearly three, and had tried to make the college go, I have evidence from her that he left the city of Muncie completely financially insolvent and spiritually broken because of the unsuccess of his attempt to make a college go. Twenty-five years later, he was worth three-quarters of a million dollars in real estate and dating. The man evidently had ability. <laughs> in the autumn of 1899, then, there were 250 students. A year later, it had dropped to 150. And in the autumn of 1901, it had dropped to 75. And here's a story, because this town gambling has come in all the time, because there were a group of 15 men here in town who were anxious to see this thing go. And so they got their heads together and said to Dr. Coomer, here's $15,000. You may call upon us for that amount of money, if you have a deficit, for five years. After the second year, when the college had dropped to 150, he went to these men, or rather he went to his trustees first to get permission to do things. And the trustees refused him permission to go to these men. And so the money that was there, raised by private citizens of the community, they helped the college over its first few years, was not used. The result was that he had to close the doors. And one of the men, of those 15 men, the guarantee of that money was Frank Clayton Ball. Frank Clayton Ball, representing his brothers, was particularly interested in the thing from the very beginning. And several times after that, came to the financial aid of the president of this college in dire circumstances. Of course, you know that he and E.B. bought the place in 1917 and gave it to the state of Indiana. It was appraised that spring by competent appraisers at $409,000. They bought it for $31,500 because nobody wanted it. And they bought it at that price and gave it to the state of Indiana. They paid for the whole thing, all the land and the buildings, and one dormitory that had been built since, Forest Hall, less than the administration building cost in the first place. I mentioned that because sometimes people don't quite get those facts straight. And I wanted to pay tribute to the Ball brothers, Mr. Bright, and I'm glad to do that at this time. The building was dedicated in August 99. I thought you might be interested in some of the people that were there at the time of the dedication. President Coomer, of course. Mayor Edward Toohey, the mayor, the, the father of the present mayor. Judge Joseph Leffler, the father of the late Judge Leffler. United States Senator Joseph For Fred Benson Foraker. Frank Heinbaugh of the Herald. Frank Jones, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, and Charles A. Van Meter, Superintendent of the County Schools, and ex officio President of the Board of Trustees. Well, he was on his way. He couldn't make it go for the reasons I've given. Therefore, early in the fall of 19, early in the spring of 1902, he had to close the doors and left Muncie with the result that I told you about his Dayton experience. The second institution that was built, that was used in this, this campus, was Palmer University. This man was a very wealthy man who lived in New York City, and he had helped a number of schools all over the country with his beneficence. Dr. Thomas McWhinney, who was a member of the faculty at Indiana College and a member of the church group behind Defiance College in Ohio, heard about the possibility of getting this campus for the purpose of establishing the school. So he went to New York and interested Mr. Palmer in this campus, in these two buildings. And Mr. Palmer said, all right, I'll give you $100,000, provided you raise the same amount of money from the friends of the proposed school. 
Dr. McWinnie went over to Defiance and persuaded Dr. John Roland Harris Latchaw, who at that time was president of Defiance, to come over here and work with him to establish a school on this campus. They immediately went to work to raise the money. They only had about six or seven months to raise $100,000 because it was supposed to be raised by January 1st, 1930. They weren't able to do it. So they asked for a year of extension. That was granted. On December 31st, 1903, they were $12,750 short of the $100,000. The phone rang in the apartment of Dr. McQuinney, who lived in the second floor of the administration <coughs> building. Of course, there was an apartment there then. <laughs> and who do you suppose was on the phone? Frank Clayton Ball. He said, how much are you short? 12750 He says, I'll give it to you. So the next morning, he announced in the paper that the $100,000 had been raised. Therefore, he sent the bill down to New York to the offices of this bank, of the, Mr. Palmer, who in the meantime had died, and the heirs contested it. They said, uh, this isn't money, this is these are promises. The gift said money. And so the courts, the surrogate court there, has sustained the demurrer, and the $100,000 had to be returned, and the school closed its doors. That was in January 1904. The third institution I mentioned was the Indiana Normal School and College of Applied Science. Two men from Indianapolis, Francis Engler and James McCormick, one a lawyer, the other a businessman, knowing the situation, came over and made overtures to the trustees of the Indiana Normal University Association and they gave them the right to organize the school. Now, Dr. Pittenger comes into this picture because he was on the faculty of this third school, the Indiana Normal School and College of Applied Science. In 1905, the doors were opened the third time and 200 students enrolled. In the summer session, 1906, there were 300 enrolled. In the fall of 1906, the second year of the college, 200 students again enrolled. But there was a fracas in a fraternity house, and there was only one, I think, this one down here by the um, College Avenue Church, that brick house, I think, was the only fraternity house on the campus at that time. Somebody had let a cow loose in the fraternity house, <laughs> and it so angered the president that he banned all the fraternities from the campus. And in those days, uh, that was a red flag to students. And so the student reaction was terrific, and they made some fuss about it. And he closed the school. <laughs> that was 1906. Now, nothing happened on this campus for five years, <coughs> except bats flying through the building. <coughs> the Chamber of Commerce, in the meantime, tried to come in the picture twice, in 1905 and 1909, to save the situation. There was a bill brought in by... Um, the late Senator Fitch, who was a member of the House of Representatives at that time, in 1909, and it failed to pass the House by seven votes. The vote against it was 49, the vote for it was 42. The bill was to establish a teacher's training institution in Muncie. It wasn't even brought up to the Senate because the name was dead. In the meantime, Mr. McCullough again, and I know but I bought the lots to save it in the first place, approached a lady by the name of Mrs. Dora Guild, and she and her family moved into the second floor of the administration building and lived there for five years in order to keep the uh, insurance in force. I mean, I had correspondence with her son, who lives out in the suburb of Chicago. He verifies these things, I've told you. <coughs> That's the way it was until 1911. And then there was a man who lived across the street from the administration building, right where this building stands, a medical doctor, Dr. B.B. Morrow, who had seen the place empty. And the moose were looking for a place to have a children's home. And so one time, he went down to Louisville, Kentucky, with a friend of his from Anderson, 
they were on an installation team for Moose. And on the way down and back, they talked the thing over. And they got so enthusiastic about it, the thing began to roll. And they went to the National Conference Convention of the Moose that year, that was 1910. They had a special committee appointed of the Moose to come to Muncie to see if this deal could be made. And one of the men who was chairman of the committee was James J. Davis, who later became Secretary of Labor in Woodrow Wilson's cabinet. For over a year, the negotiations went on between these Moose people and the trustees. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing came of it. And so that went by the boards, so we lost Moose Heart. <laughs> it went to Illinois in the Fox River. And the last figures I have, it has a $50 million plan. One of the men who came here to represent the Moose <laughs> National Office was a chap by the name of Michael D. Kelly. He made it very stringent efforts to try to get the deal through, but to no avail. But the men in charge, I don't mention any names because I don't know who they were, in Muncie was so taken with his personality, his driving energy, his vision, that they invited him to organize a school himself. That he did. And the date was October the 6th, 1911, when this institution, Muncie Normal Institute, was incorporated in Indianapolis. About a week later, the grounds were turned over to Mr. Kelly and his associates. Some of you have heard of the name of Boucher, C.W. Boucher, who used to have a normal school in Marion, and whose son was a dean at the University of Chicago when I was there, way back in the Middle Ages. <laughs> well, President Kelly was a very persuasive person. He went up there and sold the idea to Boucher that this was the place where his normal school should be because it was a plant dedicated to that proposition. And they paid Mr. Boucher $50,000 to bring his school to Muncie, which he did. That was the nucleus of the Muncie Normal Institute, Boucher's Normal School in Marion. In addition to that school, there were incorporated the National Manual Training School of Plano, Illinois, the Beardley, Beardsley Institute System of Manual Training, it was called, the Manual Training Company of Indianapolis, and the Muncie Conservatory of Music. Five institutions into one. The doors were open in September 1912, and all during the years, the five years that this school in, was in existence, the average enrollment each year was around 2,000. In the last summer session in 1917, there were 1,761 students on this campus in 1917, in the summer. Numbers, they're there. Why did it fail? Here's something interesting comes into picture, because Kelly wasn't satisfied with the teacher training institution. He wanted a hotel training institution also. So he went down to some place in Canada. I can't remember the name just now. The meeting of the National Stewards Association, and so they sold the idea to him that they should establish a training school for hotels. And he was so persuasive, I have a copy of his speech, it's really a remarkable piece of oratory, that they appointed the committee to investigate it and appropriate $200,000 on the spot. The only stipulation there was, was that the school should be out of debt. Meantime, Mr. Kelly, to get the school on a firm basis, had gone to the banks here in town and had folded a $300,000 bond issue with which to put the thing on a stable basis. These banks here in town had sold it to a bank in Chicago. Seven weeks after the bond issue had been sold to the bank in Chicago, the Chicago bank failed. <laughs> there Mr. Kelly had a large student body, an enthusiastic faculty, a town proud of the institution, and no money. All he had was tuition, but he kept it going five years in spite of that. Finally, it got deeper and deeper into debt. And the hotel training school we were supposed to have here, where Beneficence stands, went to Cornell University. And the Statler family has put $6 million into that hotel training school at Cornell. 
somebody that's moved heart. <laughs> and with the hotel training school. And you should see that building that these architects over in Indianapolis drew for that building. It was terrific. 260 rooms for students, plus the hotel training school. It was a beautiful building. A piece of financial maneuvering had been changed to Munchie National Institute, which there's no point in describing. It came to an end in September 1917 by order of the Judge Vanetta of the Superior Court. There was no circuit court here in Muncie at that time, a Superior Court. But I do want to read a statement from Mr. Kelly, which I copied from the 1914 Arba Vitae, which was the predecessor, of course, of our Orient, talking about the magnificent future for the institution. This is 1914, two years after it started. The flood of activity and tremendous cricketing of forces which have made history, inspired hope, and offered promise since that date, October 6, 1911, are all too well known and too familiar to all who will be interested enough to peruse this writing to need repetition here. Its path ahead seems free of pitfalls, and its rising sun of prosperity melts away all signs of gloom or despair. A perfect unison of voices unite in a swelling chorus proclaiming its virtue and pledging devotion to its future welfare. The Muncie Normal Institute, unfettered to any tie which binds it to the commonplace, unafraid in its conviction that right and virtue will ultimately triumph, palsied be the hand raised in sign of its destruction. <laughs> <laughs> the National American Hotel Congress headed up by the president of the Hotel Sherman in Chicago, one Joseph Byfield, had pledged five million dollars to put this national, this hotel training school on the street. Well, over a period of two years, the judge here in town had tried to sell the property because it was in default. Finally, in March 17, he appointed Kelly as the receiver and said, sell it. That was March, April, May, June, July, September. Five months later, at the east, at the south door of the courthouse, at the appointed hour of 10, the receiver, Mr. Kelly, received two bids. Thompson and Stewart, 25,000. Robe Carl White, trustee for the Ball Brothers, 27,000. Later in court, upstairs, he received a third from some auctioneers in Chicago, 27,000. The bidding went on slowly, in our terminology in the finance, till finally their bid went to 35,000. Mr. White, he went to 35,100. The Tauber people came back with 36,000. The judge said that the successful bidder that day would have to deposit half of the amount of money finally agreed upon with the county clerk and to pay, pay their other half in 10 days. The Tauber people, who had outbid the balls, $900, said they'd be glad to pay half of it but they didn't want to pay the rest of it until they sold the property. The judge said, Rob Carl White's bid is the best bid hereby sold to the Ball Brothers because they gave him a check immediately for 17000 something. And three days later, I have a copy of the receipt. They paid the rest. So, that came in the hands of F.C. and E.B. and their wives on the 25th day of September, 1917. Now, there's another man here in town to whom we should pay great tribute. His name is Charles McGonagall. He was a, a man in the abstract business. And in that year, he was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee of the House in Indianapolis. Uh, two years before this sale had happened here, some man in Indianapolis, and I have a description of the real estate property, wanted to give three nice pieces of real estate to the university at uh, Boone. And they went down to President Bryan 
he did, and said, here's this property I'd like to give to the university in exchange for an annuity the rest of my life. And the President Bryan said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I have no authority to do anything like that. And word got back to McGonagall, and he said, well, let's make it legal. So he had the people here in town who have represented the board for many, many years, the Warner, Clark and Warner firm, write a law. Mr. The late Mr. Everett Warner told me that he wrote the law. And it was introduced in 1917, the same year the Bulls got the property, in January, by Senator Gentry from Bloomington. So everybody in the le legislature, knowing the story of the property here before, thought this was a make it legal for this man to give money to the university. He went through the House with one dissenting vote. He went through the Senate with a complete affirmative vote. It was made law on the 25th day of February, 1917, by Governor Goodrich. Shortly after that, a few weeks after that, the ball was announced in the public paper that they wanted to give the property to the Indiana Normal School to establish a teacher training school on this campus. That's the story behind that you may have heard rumors about. I've been trying to establish uh, whether there's any connection between Mr. McGonigal's act and the wish of the Ball brothers, because some eight months elapsed, you see, or seven or eight months elapsed before the law was passed. I can and feel free, I think, to say that there was a sympathetic attitude there because Governor Goodrich was known to the Ball brothers, and so was Mr. McGonigal, and Mr. McGonigal was the go-between between, between the Ball brothers and the state board down at uh, Terre Haute after the announcement of the debate. It took eight months after the law was passed, I mean after the purchase of the property, before the uh, trustees at Terre Haute would accept it. They were very cherry about it. Dr. Parsons didn't want a second school in the state to train teachers. He was very much opposed to it. And there was a man here in town named Benjamin Moore. He was superintendent of the school and became our first dean, your predecessor. And he was a graduate of Terre Haute. And so the Board of Strategy met up in the Warner office one day. Not only which one of the balls was there at the FC. At least one of the balls was there. Everett Warner was there. Charles McGonigal, those three, and more. I got this straight from McGonigal in writing. And so they said, now, Benjamin, you know these people down there. You go down and see Parsons and see what you can do about it. So he went down to Terre Haute. Mr. Parsons had recently married a very charming lady who used to be dean of women. He knew her very well. So he worked through the lady. And finally, the agreement was made that perhaps it wouldn't be too bad if it didn't cost Mr. Parsons any extra money. This was April 1918. We were at war. Parsons had half of the student body and a full faculty. If it had happened the year before or the year after, it would be much harder to persuade him. didn't cost him any extra money to have his faculty come up. He'd you'll be Christy and the rest of them, because they were already employed, employed at Terre Haute. So they came up here, so it would cost nothing more. And the governor had take, taken that same position too. It was not to be any extra appropriations for this institution at that time. So the vote was taken. Listen, listen carefully. Because the anniversary and the founding of this school was April the 4th, 1918. When I was a neophyte on this campus, we used to celebrate on the 14th. I don't know why. But April the 4th was the day that the board voted to accept the giving of the balls. Well, I'm down through page 9. I got 14 to go. <laughs> Now, in closing, <laughs> I hope that this review of uh, some of the efforts, incidents, and personalities that helped to shape Ball State's future will prompt in us an ever deeper appreciation of its accomplishments. For these pathways, 
that have led through the years to the significant educational highways, we are all deeply grateful. And I'm sure you can say with me, dear alma mater, hear our vow. We will continue to put our faith and trust in thee. As I approach Route 66, on the higher way labeled Emeritus, with all these rich remembrances, I affirm that parting can be sweet sorrow. Mm -hmm.